and welcome to The Spectrum Show, the show dedicated to the Sinclair ZX Spectrum. Coming up in this episode, we get all the Sinclair news and top selling Spectrum games from December 1985. We gaze lovingly at cover art. I'll review some older games. Take a look at a newer title. We give you some playing tips. We pay a visit to Typing Corner. And end with my demo of the month. But first, it's back to December 1985 for the news. The UK release of the new Sinclair machine moves a little closer as a large shipment of machines arrives at our shores. 3,000 units were shipped from South Korea to Cambridge, but Sinclair refused to comment on exactly where the machines were heading. They did confirm that the new machine, the Spectrum 1 to 8, will be launched early next year, so these may be the first batches in preparation for what no doubt will be a large demand. The first mouse for the Spectrum has been released by AMX, who already produced mice for other micros. The AMX mouse will come as a package and include the mouse itself, an interface that doubles up as a Centronics connector and some software. The software will allow for icons and drop down menus and will feature new commands for basic and machine code use. The complete package will cost $69.95. The eagerly awaited follow up to The Hobbit has finally been released by Melbourne House. Lord of the Rings Part 1 is based on Tolkien's first book and comes complete with a copy of the novel along with two cassettes. The game is a graphic adventure, allowing you to swap between characters and explore the world of Middle-earth. Sinclair have released its financial figures for the year ending March 1985, and it's not good news. The previous year, they turned over £14.2 million profit, but this year they showed a loss of £18.3 million. The figures represent a horrible year for Circlife's company, most of which you can hear about in previous news. The company continues to increase turnover though, with exports going up, so they still hope for Sinclair. With the launch of the new 128K machine next year, many high street stores are beginning to reduce the price of the older Spectrum Plus, and for the first time it can be purchased for less than £100. W8 Smith are offering the machine for £99.95 on its own, and are still selling the joystick interface and games bundle for £139.95. And now onto the top selling games. With this being the festive season, many of the main titles were released last month, but new into the charts this month comes Robin of the Wood by Odin, a Sabre Wolf like adventure game. Beachhead 2 by US Gold, the follow up to the first hit. International Karate by System 3, a very impressive fighting game. Commando from Elite a version of the arcade classic. And Swords and Sorcery from PSS, an impressive 3D role playing game. And that was the news and top selling games for December 1985. In the early days of home computing, there was no internet. And if you were a software house, there was a limited number of ways you could get your game noticed on the shelf. Not many companies had the revenue to run large adverts in magazines, many just having a small eighth size box somewhere near the back. Word of mouth played a large part in things, as did magazine reviews, but faced with a shelf full of games, how would you make your particular offering stand out? The answer for many companies was game art. Very early game art consisted of black and white images, maybe with some spot colour thrown in. In these cases the art had to excite the user, had to draw them in. It had to depict, in a few inches of space, the whole essence of the game. Most of the early ones were not done by professional artists, and some of them were definitely hand drawn. The end result was a mixed economy of different looking products. As the market matured, when the marketing war began to hot up, the shops began to be flooded by games, and the companies had to rethink their strategies if they were going to be successful. And this often ended up with a series of game packaging that matched. The company looked more professional if it had a logo too, 
as this can be used to identify other games from the same stable. Something which sold games even if they were rubbish. I remember buying Centipede, before its name was changed to Centibug, from DKtronics, just because I wanted the full set. The game was average at best, but it meant there was no gaping hole in my collection. Collectors were being tempted, and who could resist? Many companies now employed a graphic artist, and the artwork took a huge leap forward, with some of the best game art to this day, I think. Companies like Silversoft, Imagine, Ocean, PSS and Rabbit released games that could easily be identified, and that drew in the collectors. If you had the first five games from a company, and they brought out a new one with matching artwork and packaging, you just had to have it. Game art and professional imaging is something that we take for granted now with multi-million pound investments in games, but this was the dawn of computer entertainment marketing. Browsing through my collection, some of the images are truly wonderful to look at. Particular favourites being from the likes of Quicksilver and Softech and Imagine. Schizoids is brilliant, it's just a pity that the game was rubbish. But that was part of the lure, part of the plan to get you to buy. vary between companies too. Some chose a cartoon look, even if the game was a shoot 'em up. Others swayed towards fantasy art. PSS's early games all matched and had a very basic look, but at the same time you knew what the game was about. In these early days it was very rare to find a real photograph on a cover, this being mainly held back for strip poker games or games featuring semi-naked women, like Barbarian 2 or Vixen. Around the mid-80s there was a quiet revolution, and gamers were beginning to get annoyed with the companies tricking them into buying their games based on the artwork. Remember, there was no internet, and the magazines were often swayed by large advertising promises. It was then that screenshots began to appear, but again the marketing machine was up to its old tricks again. Many Spectrum games included screenshots from other formats, typically Commodore or Amstrad, but that really was a con. Luckily this type of marketing is no longer possible due to the World Wide Web and of course the limited range of hardware, at least compared to the 80s. Most games look the same now, despite the hardware they're played on, but the marketers are still up to the old tricks, showing FMV in adverts with tiny text at the bottom saying, not actual game footage. How can a game be sold by showing something that's not game footage? I'm not a huge fan of modern games, and it amazes me that people think that pre-rendered video is somehow linked to the quality of the actual game. I was amazed recently when a friend showed me a game he just bought. I won't mention it by name, but it took about 20 minutes to get to the part where you could actually interact with it. And we used to moan about waiting 5 minutes for a game to load. Oh well, I'll shut up now. Anyway, the next time you glance at your games collection, or play a game you've downloaded from the internet, take time to look up the artwork. It was part of the game, and it makes playing it so much more enjoyable. Plasteroids was released in the arcades by Atari in 1987, and was the sequel to the popular Asteroids game. For this release though, eight years after its predecessor, all of the game elements have been upgraded. The vector graphics have been replaced by colour sprites, the sound has been boosted with some great effects, and the gameplay given a makeover, but the core asteroid blasting thankfully remains. Added elements include three ship types, limited fuel, different regions, motherships, 
different asteroid types, power-ups, multiplayer and boss battles. A lot to squeeze into the Spectrum. The Spectrum version was developed by Imageworks in 1989 and has all of the arcade features, which is a great achievement. The graphics and sound have obviously been toned down to suit the Sinclair machine, but everything is very familiar and works really well. Once in a sector, you have to clear all of the asteroids out before you can move on. And here we find ourselves in very familiar territory. The ship is controlled the same way as asteroids, rotate left and right, thrust and fire. Some asteroids though are different colours, which indicate they are holding something. If they are destroyed, they drop whatever it is, and this can be collected. Magenta asteroids hold replenishment for your energy. Your energy is used whenever you thrust or hit an asteroid, so these are important. In later sectors you will meet saucers and other alien ships. Destroying these will leave behind things like shields. In later levels you also get homing ships and these head straight for you, so these have to be taken out quickly or they will soon sap your energy. Once all of the asteroids are clear, a warp pad arrives to whisk you off to the next rock filled sector. You can choose which sector to go to, and there are indications of what awaits you when you go there. As the grain progresses, there are more and more things to destroy you, and adversely, more and more things to collect and use. The graphics are nice and smooth, but obviously don't have the colour of the arcade. This is to be expected, I suppose, but they are well drawn and move really well. Sound is a bit of a letdown. You have a weak firing sound and an unimpressive explosion sound, but that's about it. The backgrounds of the arcade are mimicked using dots, which look okay, but don't add much to the game. Playability is great. The accurate controls, which can be keyboard or joystick, work really well, and the whole experience is very close to the arcade. Once you've cleared all the sectors, you head off into the boss battle, which is pretty tricky. Most of the time you just bounced around the screen, with little chance to correct your movement. I just kept firing and hoped for the best, and it seemed to get me through the first boss at least. I also got a ship upgrade, which made it larger which in turn made it more difficult to avoid things. I like this game. i played it for ages, and it certainly makes up for the lack of poor asteroid clones on the spectrum. A highly recommended game then. Give it a try. Nineteen eighty three witnessed a whole mass of games being released for what was then a brand new computer. The market by mid nineteen eighty three was flooded with every arcade clone you can think of and a plethora of unique and original games. Many of the early ones were, to be polite, little more than glorified type ins. Race Fun, released by Rabbit Software in nineteen eighty three, falls midway between arcade clone and early not so good release. We shouldn't really judge early games because at the time, every release, with very few exceptions, reached the same standards, but more about that later. So what we have here then is a race game, with very simple rules. The faster you go, the more points you get. Hitting anything reduces your fuel, and so your points. On the left hand side we have a speedometer and a fuel gauge and on the right, the track itself. The track scrolls down the screen in 8 pixel jumps, starting off straight and wide, but soon becoming narrower and winding. There are other cars on the track too, that you have to avoid. Hitting these will slow you down and lose you fuel, which in turn will lose you points. Once your fuel runs out, that's the end of the game, and there are no refueling points. The simple top-down graphics also move in 8 pixel jumps, 
which makes the game challenging when things start to move quickly and the road is only wide enough for one or two cars. The engine sound is fine, and there is what I think is tyre squealing sounds whenever you move left or right. The controls are just left, right, accelerate and brake. But the main problem is that you can't press more than one key at a time, so you can't, for example, accelerate and move left. And this makes things very tricky indeed, and often causes you to crash into cars or sides of the road. It's a simple game for a simple era in the Spectrum's history. There were many typing games that played exactly like this one, and there is nothing here that stands out above the crowd. The author, John Kane, went on to much better things like Booty, for example, but in these early days he was learning just like everyone else. The market was booming and things were moving fast. In early 1983, this was a typical example of what you'd expect from games. By the end of 1983, we had the likes of the early Ultimate games, Android 2, Ant Attack, 3D Death Chase, Manic Miner, Pogo, and a whole host of other great games. So what we have here then is an early example of a racing game that's fun to play for a few times, but there's little depth or replayability. It might be worth playing if you like this sort of thing, but there's nothing that stands out. Xanthius was released by players in 1987, and is a bit of a curious game. World of Spectrum has it listed as a shoot 'em up but it certainly isn't that. The game is more of a maze exploration platform game, and absolutely no shooting whatsoever. The story goes that a small protopod maintenance droid has been sent to repair atmospheric processing stations on the planet Xanthius. These have malfunctioned and need spare parts to get them back up and running. Now, the game's instructions are not very explicit about what you have to do, or in fact how you do it, so it took me a while to work out the game mechanics, and even now I'm not sure about a few aspects of the game. Anyway, let's get on with things. You control the protodroid, which can move around and jump. The actual physics are strange, but once you get used to them you can take advantage of a few glitches in the game, or maybe they're supposed to be features, I'm not really sure. The program has tried to put some kind of intelligence for the droid's movement and standing, so that it can automatically move over things like plants or animals. This also means, unfortunately, that moving platforms tend to drag the droid above them, and in some cases you can actually walk through solid walls if you position the droid correctly. So, what do you have to do? Searching the planet, you'll soon discover the APs. You can get to them by beaming up, using the beam from the platform beneath, or by just standing on top of them. Once there, you can press down and fire, or the A key, to log in. And here you get a menu with various things. You can get report on what's broken, for example. You can enable and disable the unit, and start repairing different sections. Before you can repair them, however, you have to shut them down. So you must make sure you have enough parts to fix them, or you won't be able to turn them back on without damaging them. This means you have to leave them turned off while you go get other parts, and this will degrade the atmosphere and cause all kinds of badness. So, first you deactivate them, then repair each section, then reactivate them. Once that's done, it's off to find another AP. You can also drain or charge these units while standing on top of them, pressing the A and J keys, and this will make various pointers at the top of the screen move up and down. I'm not really sure what effect this has. I presume it's to keep them from losing charge or something. At some stage you will run out of parts, as you only have 15, and you can order more by connecting to the main generator. Now the thing is, you can only order more parts when you have none left, so at some stage you're going to have to leave at least one AP offline. So this is where the strategy comes in. The best policy is to leave the ones closest to the generator until you have only a few parts left, so you can quickly get more without leaving the units offline for too long. The droid also has an energy bar which is top right, and this drains if he collides with anything. But, if you collide with some creatures on the planet, this can be replenished. One weird thing is that you can jump onto the plants and crush them. This doesn't seem to have any effect, but it does increase your score. 
back to the game and the glitch. You've seen in the video by now how you can seemingly glide up the sides of platforms, and in one place you can actually ascend through the pipes. I don't know if this is a bug or not, but it certainly helps the game. The graphics are very nice and smooth, very colourful and well drawn. The main sprite does bob about a bit, but I think this is linked to the semi-intelligence mentioned earlier. Other than that though, it's well animated and easy to control. Sound is a bit of a letdown, with the best effects being used for the repair sequences. Normal gameplay when walking about is done in near silence though. Difficulty wise, it's average, but the gameplay is long and laborious, and it doesn't help that the instructions are so vague. The game concept is good, and I spent a good few hours playing it. That was after I finally figured out what I'm supposed to be doing. Some games ended abruptly for reasons I couldn't understand, and in one case I was congratulated for completing the game after repairing only two APs. Overall then, not a bad game if you like platformers with a bit of strategy. I noticed this game hasn't got any cheats or playthroughs yet either, although there is a map if you get stuck. Why not give it a try, now that you know how to play it. Alter was a rarely seen arcade game released in 1981 by Sidelsa. It was a shoot 'em up in the old school style, with diving aliens, star fields, and boss battles. Great! When a Spectrum conversion was released in 2014 by IBM, I quickly downloaded it and fired up the emulator. As with all old school shooters, the idea is simple avoid being blown up, shoot as much as you can, and aim for a high score. The game has elements of Galaxian and Gorf and Phoenix, with attack waves of various aliens. The movement of the attacks make them tricky to hit, so this is no walk in the park. Movement is smooth and responsive, which is paramount for shooters. The sound on the arcade was a little odd, and I'm not sure if that was the actual sound, or a problem with emulation via MAME. The Spectrum version has better sound in my opinion. Graphics wise, the game comes quite close, obviously not being able to reproduce the multicoloured aliens, but everything else is nicely done. Gameplay wise it's tough, but then again so is the arcade. That doesn't mean it's not a good game, in fact I really like it. It's not often we get a good shoot em up on the specky, and this one more than fills in the gaps.
So if you're a shoot 'em up fan, especially from the early arcade style games, then you'll love this. Go and give it a try. This week we're going to be taking a look at Bounder. First level of Bounder, there are actually 10 free lives, additional lives available to the player if they can bounce around the screen and get to the right positions. So I'm going to show you where those are and how to get them. So starting on level 1, the first life is to the right, but you don't want to move immediately to the right because one of the first baddies that comes onto the screen is a kind of flying creature that will home in on you. So you need to get past that using the long jump and then go to the right and you get six extra balls. Then you want to move to the left and you'll find two bonus balls. Then you want to go back to the right, and this one's really hard to get, and you get another two bonus balls. And actually, then you want to move back to the left, because if you don't, you're pretty much going to die. And that's the end of the game. Or the end of the level. Okay, that was a short and sweet one today, but I hope that helps people play Boundary. And if you haven't played the game before, search it out and have a go of it. It is a really, really good game. Welcome to Type In Corner, showing games that have not been seen for over 20 years. Some games, in fact a lot of games featured in Type Ins, were terrible. The ones I typed out in the 80s, and that have appeared here, were pretty good when compared to some of the attempts that the magazines were publishing. So then, here is an example of a poor game. Defender, written by Nick Wilson from Popular Computing Weekly in December 1982. The listing was tiny, about a third of a page, and ideal for typing in. Down to the game itself then. As you can probably guess, it's an attempt at the arcade classic, but it falls way short. There is scrolling landscape, but only in one direction, and I suppose that's not bad when you consider it's a typing. Your ship can only move up and down too. An alien moves slowly from the right, and you have to shoot it. You only have 20 shots for every 10 aliens, so that means you have to aim really carefully. If the alien gets to the left hand side, it's game over, as simple as that. If you run out of bullets, it's also game over. And when I say game over, I actually mean it. The game displays a message, and then nothing happens. If you want to try again, you have to break out of the program and run it from the start. The game has absolutely no sound, so really this would be an ideal thing to start tinkering about and tweaking a few things. And that's about the only positive thing I can say about the game. This is probably the first time it's been seen since it was published, and it will be available to download from my blog shortly. Welcome to the demo of the month, and this month's demo is Bomb by 8-Bit, released in 2007. The demo has a unique style, and the coders came up with a concept and stuck with it throughout the full 3 minutes and 48 seconds. Starting off slowly, it soon grows, and you quickly see the idea behind it. Attribute squares. Sometimes rounded, sometimes not, and I suppose you can compare it to those old window signs with a fixed matrix of points that had scrolling text messages. Obviously, the Spectrum has a full screen of attribute squares and more colours, so the coders went to work and produced some great looking effects. There are a lot of normal demo features in here, but all of them converted into the attribute box styling. There's plasma effects, zoom vectors, vector bobs, coloured helixes, scroll text, rotating cubes, all displayed using the Spectrum's 8x8 pixel attributes. A really well put together demo with some nice music, 
There's something different for a change. It runs on a standard 1 to 8K machine, so why not check it out? Well, that's the end of this episode. I hope you enjoyed it, and thanks for watching. You can get in touch by using the details on screen. See you soon.